together with Ratna Shrestha, Tzimik Sakya, Catherine Hacker, and Sarah Schneiderman, I'm one of the founding members of the Button, <laughs> the UBC Himalaya program. So before going any further, as is our custom here, I'd like to take a moment to not only acknowledge, but also recognize and reflect on our location here, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Hunkaminam speaking Musqueam people, who have been nurturing these lands and living and playing here for thousands of years before UBC was invented. And I thank the Musqueam community for their ongoing guidance and the direction they offer to the wide community here at UBC. The UBC Himalaya program draws upon faculty expertise, student engagement, community partnerships to create an interdisciplinary hub of knowledge sharing about the Himalayan region. And that includes Bhutan, China, India, Nepal, Pakistan, and the Tibetan cultural zones that traverse and transect all of these countries. Beginning in the fall of 2015, Initial projects in which we've been engaged have included developing a language partner program to create opportunities for learning Nepali and Tibetan here at UBC. And we're very excited to announce that the third round of our language courses will start in May 2018 in the first and second weeks. So for those interested in language learning, watch that space. We've developed a speaker and an event series, which brings us here this evening, and also created the beginnings of an interdisciplinary network across UBC and the broader Metro Vancouver area. It's been hugely satisfying to see such interest and engagement from students, alumni, community partners, and intellectual leaders from the Himalayan region who live here in the region of Vancouver. We have, through the Himalaya program, a modest and very non-invasive email list, uh, which you can learn a bit about what we do if you wish to sign up for that, uh, the activities and the community-facing courses that we provide. Please consider signing up. And we wouldn't be in a position to do the work that we do without the support we've received from a large number of units across this campus. So I'd like to recognize them this evening, in part to thank them, but also to encourage them to continue funding us. And that is the Teaching and Learning Enhancement Fund, the UBC Center for Community Engaged Learning, the Institute of Asian Research, and the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs. And this evening's unique program has specific supporters who I'd like to recognize. Along with the Himalaya program, we have um, the Institute of Asian Research, the Center for India and South Asian Research, the Department of Asian Studies, the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies, the Asia, Canadian and Asian Migration Studies Program, the Faculty of Arts, and our colleagues at the Irving K. Barber Learning Center. And we're very excited that in response to a lot of interest we've had from community members and folks across the Himalayan region who can't make it out to Vancouver this evening, um, we're able to offer both a live stream and also a digital archive of this presentation and discussion this evening. Thanks once again to the Ike Baba Learning Center. So with that, I'd like to invite my colleague, Tiling Sakya, who will be introducing our speakers this evening and outline the format of this evening's proceedings. Thank you. Tiling. Thank you, Mark. I'm really uh, <coughs> delighted to be able to welcome our two speakers. Uh, I've been following their writings. I went on my bookshelf and trying to rate and find their books, uh, and I realized actually I have them all and been reading them. And also, you know, when, as academics, we are teaching courses on Himalaya or um, Tibet. We find it very difficult to find uh, books to recommend to our students, which is, we can say, the authentic voice of uh, people in Tibet or Nepal, and um, there are writings in Tibetan and Nepali, but you know, they're, they're not translated, and so we, we cannot put that on the reading list. So the works by Manchu Shithapa and Sring uh, um, Omla, you know, it's really God sent to us because we can put their writings on, on our reading list. <laughs> and I often say to people, why are there so many sort of Bengali scholars are recognized? because there are other Bengali scholars are putting on their reading list other Bengali scholars. So I think we people work from Himalayas should put on our reading list writers from Himalayas. 
so that our <laughs> community will be more recognized uh, in the sort of academia. So, so future, when you uh, are sort of academic and working, please put uh, sort of all sort of Himalayan writers on your reading list, mm -hmm. so that how uh, our, like Bengalis will be better known. Uh, so first, I'd like to introduce to Tilling Omotamba, um, whose work I've been following for many years. Uh, she was raised in India and Nepal, and received her sort of, uh, formative education in uh, Delhi University, and uh, she pursued the um, MA from University of Massachusetts Amherst, and created writings from San Francisco State University. And um, her first book of poems, Rules of the House, publisher Apuchi Press in 2002, was finalist for Asian American Literary Award in 2003. Other publications include My Rice Tastes Like the Lake, again, Apuchi Press, in, and these other poetry books, the, In the Absence of Every Day, and um, uh, the Two other books were the, the writing the names, uh, it's a collection of her poems. And in 2013, um, her sort of uh, major book, uh, non sort of fiction, it's a book um, uh, titled Home in Tibet, which is um, about her sort of return to Tibet and uh, belonging to, you know, as a Tibetan, we have as refugees, I often find it, it's, people say, where are you from, where's your home? I never know what to say, Kathmandu or London or Vancouver or Lhasa. You know, actually we belong to all these places and we always have home of our ancestors or our parents, yet we don't live there. And yet we have a memory. So it seems like so the book on home in Tibet was really quite moving and intricate account of sort of return to Nanjing uh, in the Tibet. And I'm now sort of putting that book on uh, our reading list. And the Manjushri Thapa is again, um, for, uh, I was very fortunate being in the SOAS and uh, one of my dear friends was Michael Hart and who translated many of Nepali uh, writings uh, in, into English. And so I got to know about Nepali writings before actually, although Tibetans, we speak Nepali, but we don't read. So we don't really know about the literature uh, as said, but it was only from going to London, I learned about Nepali literature. And um, Manchu Thapa is now perhaps one of the best known uh, writers from Nepal, and she writes both fiction and non-fiction. And also she's translating uh, Nepali works into English. And I regard the sort of translation of uh, books are really important. That's the only way that uh, people will, that outside our language environment, that people will know about work. I mean, you know, there's a huge, uh, I'm always impressed. Uh, Nepali is perhaps the lingua franca of Himalaya. If you go from Ladakh, Himachal to Assam, Actually, when we meet each other, we have to speak in Nepali. You know, when Tibetans meet with the Bhutanese, we speak to each other in Nepali. And the Tibetans meet people from Mustang, we speak in the Nepali. And uh, sort of Nepali is sort of our lingua franca. And the other thing is that in, even in Dharamsala, uh, there is a Nepali literary magazine. There's a huge Nepali community and there's literary magazines, which we are not aware of. And uh, this work being translated is... Uh, it gives the exposure and the recognition it uh, uh, deserves. So, um, Manjushri Thapa translated the um, latest publication is the uh, Indra Badurai, who's actually from Kashong in Darjeeling, and his uh, novel, uh, There's a Carnival Today, which um, just won the uh, American Pen Translation Award. Uh, well, and that's very uh, prestigious uh, recognition. And uh, I'm more familiar with Manjushri's uh, novels and uh, non-fiction writing because uh, one of the things, uh, past few decades, Nepal has been in such a turbulent period uh, of uh, insurgency, civil war, revolution, establishment, and we're trying to understand what is going on in Nepal. 
And when I talked to a lot of people in Nepal, nobody could really explain, and there wasn't any accessible literature which I can read and try to figure out what was going on in Nepal. And um, since I don't read Nepali, I can read the press or I can read Manjushri's uh, work, which really was helpful for me to understand the intricacy of the, all the political unrest and the uncertainty that was happening. And particularly, I mean, I really, <laughs> my heart a lot in here. This, um, I, firstly, it attracted me because being a historian and, and the book title has history, then you always gravitate toward the title, you know, history, the, the tutor of history. And it was one of the written novels I was so impressed. And it also learned a great deal about Nepal because uh, we don't know outside Kathmandu. You know, we think we know Nepal, but we live in Kathmandu, and our families live in Kathmandu, and we really don't know what's happening outside. And so this book was really important for me in terms of education about Nepal in the wider community. Um, she also written uh, non-fiction books, like the Mustang, uh, Mustang Bought in a Fragment, uh, forget Kathmandu and the lives we we'll, we have lost, which is also I found provided to me personally. It's really insightful uh, account of the, the, the decade-long uh, conflict in Nepal, um, and it was really important sort of book in explaining the situation. And um, her she has published the four other novels. Um, Till the Earth, Seasons of Flight, All of Us in Our Lives, uh, numerous, and that's the, the uh, latest publication is the trans, um, translation of Indra Badr Rai's novel. And so I'm really glad to be able to welcome two of the writers who I really read and um, follow and also been sort of educational for me uh, to learn about the, our home country. And um, when I posted an uh, announcement on my Facebook, it ignited a huge debate, you know, and people said, what is Himalayan literature? You know, all the Tibetans heard of Tsiling Ongmo, they never heard of uh, uh, Manjushri, and they said, oh, who's Manjushri? Then the, all the Nepali friends heard of Manjushri, not heard of Tsiling Ongmo. And what is I keep saying, what is common? I said, they're both from Kathmandu. <laughs> and I said, it's a, we call it, I don't want to debate about Himalayan, we we'll call it literature from Kathmandu. <laughs> That's a common thing. Otherwise, you know, the, Nepalis have said, we are not calling the Nepali literature and Tibetans have said that they were not calling the Tibetan literature. So I think if the compromise is, is really it's literature from Kathmandu. You know, that's what way we grew up. That's where their background essentially our formative lives were spent in Kathmandu. And even then I don't know whether we can say speak about Tibet or anything, but at least we can speak about Kathmandu in that way. So I welcome Sri Homo and Manjushri. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, how we have arranged this is, uh, you know, um, make a uh, way that our uh, guests can uh, present uh, some background and their sort of, uh, you know, purpose of writing, that what they see as importance of their work. So, I'll just call Manjushri Thapa to give a presentation, then followed by Sri Mamala. Thank you. Thank you, Selma. Um, do I need to turn this on also? Is that... No. Um, thank you, Selma, for that wonderful introduction and to Mark for the introduction before that. Um, I uh, am very pleased to be in the territory of the Musqueam people. I am right now living in the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of New Credit and Huron and Wendat of other First Nations. Um, so, and I was born in the traditional territories of the Newar people. So, it's a, it's very exciting to um, be able to move through all of these lands and learn so much from all of them. Um, I want to talk uh, about a pro the project that I'm working on right now, which is the Canadian um, edition of my last novel, All of Us in Our Own Lives, came out 
in South Asia uh, uh, last year and is going to come out in Canada next year from um, Freehand Press, which is a small literary publishing house in um, Alberta. And uh, it's been really interesting for me. I've never had this experience of editing a book that I wrote in English for another territory, which is also an English reading um, uh, uh, readership. Um, but so it's been a lot like trying to translate a book from South Asian English into North American English. So for me, a very interesting experience of trying to, um, I think when we assume a South Asian readership, we write with a certain amount of complexity. The character, ha uh, the novel has four main characters. There are a lot of secondary characters. There are a lot of Nepali terms, like, you know, a lot of us don't refer to each other by name. We refer to each other as Daju or Didi or Baini or, um, you know, all of these family terms and the sort of kinship linkages that you assume that the uh, South Asian reader is going to understand. Um, but for a North American reader, you have to make a little bit more accessible. So it's been an interesting um, process of editing it. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background for the novel and um, and read a little bit from it. It's a novel that I've been wanting to work with for a long time. I tend to work out of concepts, um, sort of novels of ideas, and I wanted to write a novel. Um, for a long time, I'd been wanting to write about aid in Nepal because it's such an important and uh, powerful industry in Nepal and it really shapes so many lives. Um, I also have been very interested in the idea of um, the Buddhist idea of interdependence and interdependent co-arising. So I wanted to sort of uh, write a novel that was set in the aid world where people who really don't have much relationship with each other end up affecting each other's lives and shaping each other's lives. So I spent many years trying to put the story together and it's uh, it has three female protagonists. One is a Canadian woman who is working in Bay Street, which is the big financial center of Toronto. And she's a corporate lawyer and she's a little frustrated. She was also originally adopted from Nepal. So she's a little lost in her life, doesn't really uh, like the career that she's chosen for herself, and ends up joining an organization in Nepal, uh, an aid organization which is at the hi highest part of the aid hierarchy in Nepal, which is the donor organization. Uh, so she ends an uh, joins an organization called IDAF. That's the, the uh, I forget what IDAF stands for, but it's in the novel. Mm -hmm. um, and then another protagonist is Indira, who uh, works in the second most powerful kind of org aid organization in Nepal, which is the international NGO which both receives aid from the big donor organizations and also gives aid to smaller partner NGOs, national NGOs. Um, and then there's someone who is at the lowest hierarchy of the aid organizations, which is a young woman who uh, ends up being a beneficiary of a community-based organization in a village. So I needed these three characters to sort of ricochet off each other and affect each other and um, and sort of uh, uh, shape each other's lives in some way. Uh, to make that meeting happen, I also needed one other character, which is uh, Sapana, is the, the young woman in the village, the, the recipient of aid, um, the beneficiary of all of this, this incredible aid infrastructure. Um, and her brother, Ganu, uh, is one of the main characters also. So I've got four main characters, and he I wanted in there to reflect the reality of the country, which is that it's a country propped up by two things. One is by aid and the other one is by uh, uh, Nepalese who are working abroad. So Gyanu works in uh, Dubai and uh, has no intention really of working in Nepal but has to come back for family reasons and the story takes place during that time when he's back. So. Um, in writing this novel, I wanted to do many things. I wanted to discuss, obviously, because it, all of my characters are women and I wanted to set it in the aid world, I also wanted to set it particularly in the women's empowerment industry, which is quite large in Nepal, and, um, and to talk about, you know, to find a way to discuss women's empowerment in a fiction, in a work of fiction, 
through a story where it's, you know, a story of a novel can never really be a polemic. It can never really discuss these issues openly, but you can have different characters coming at each other from different angles and uh, causing the reader to question and to think and to wonder about these issues. So, um, so I had uh, done all of this. The section I want to uh, read is where um, the main Canadian lawyer has come to Nepal. Her name is Ava. And uh, she is, has come to Nepal. She's set up in the organization. She finds herself living in a very, for what is for her, a sort of jarring and dissonant life in the sort of expatriate uh, bubble of Kathmandu, which is quite, a, quite an inc incredible place. And I know some anthropologists have begun to study it or have been studying it. And I think it really is a space that deserves a lot of attention. It's a very interesting space. So she's finding herself there, someone who had been adopted from Nepal as a young um, baby from Balmandir, uh, and she has no idea what to do with her past. She has had a very uncomfortable relationship with her own uh, background and the fact that she was from Nepal originally adopted. Um, and so she, in this section, is beginning to get closer to figuring it. Or, or, or to approaching her background a little bit. So I wanted to um, do many things in this section, not just, you know, sort of have all of these characters uh, play different um, parts in their story, but also like lay, do, sort of lay out the landscape of Kathmandu and the aid world. So uh, this is one chapter that is entirely to do with her. I'm going to get some water before I start reading. doesn't dry out entirely. Um, Ava woke up parched, her head throbbing and her body stiff. She'd had too much to drink again. Tomas, which, who is someone who is in the aid world uh, that she's become friends with. Tomas was trouble, he really was. Every time they met, he led her on a tear. And why did she follow so willingly? Last night, they had started out at a low-budget den near his apartment. Then they'd caught a cab to a Tibetan neighborhood, Bodha, to meet Tomas's friends. He had described them as drukpas, nomads, yak herders. I met them last year on the Tibetan plateau. The nomads turned out to be jean-clad hipsters who spoke not a word of English. At a diner overlooking a candlelit Buddha stupa, they'd had noodles and a fermented millet beer called tuba, tumba, something like that. Then Tomas took them out to a nightclub called The Rocks. It's where Kathmandu's rich kids come to let off steam, he had said. They'd done tequila shots and danced to the relentless beat of journey. Don't stop believing. Hold on to that feeling. Ava couldn't remember the cab ride back, but recalled hazily that Tomas had accompanied her home. Yes, he'd uncorked a bottle of wine, railing about international aid's complicity in perpetuating inequality in Nepal. This was his favorite subject when drunk. This isn't a poor country. What it needs is a redistribution of wealth, he had said. Aid is preventing Nepal from having a proper revolution. Ava had suggested several times that they call it a night, but he'd gone on and on and on, saying only humanitarian work is justified in this country, till Ava had excused herself to go to bed, leaving him where? Warily, she glanced across the bed, and there he was, buried under sheets, pillows, clothes. Jesus. She slipped out of bed and went downstairs. The house was all hers today. Upon her insistence, Luna, who is the maid, had stopped coming in on weekends, though the landlady had come over to argue with her about it. Sunday, no holiday, Nepal. Ava had refused to give in to Mrs. Thapa, that's the landlady, um, <laughs> had refused to give in to Mrs. Thapa. Jolishwar, who was the gardener, came in thrice a week. Harihar, the guard, lived on the grounds in a house by the gate, a servant's quarter. But he kept to himself. Ava saw him only when he opened the gate for her. She went to the kitchen and made coffee, enough for Tomas too, when he woke up. Tomas really intrigued her. He was half Montreal, half Venice, effortlessly cosmopolitan. He had left home early and had worked in Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Afghanistan, and Haiti before coming to Nepal. He was full of stories, and he wasn't bad to look at with a lazy eye that gave him a dreamy look, though it was too bad about the gold tooth. He had had an incisor capped after a trip to Tibet, and it glinted sickly and yellow when he smiled. 
Ava took the coffee and two mugs out to the garden. Mrs. Thapa's balcony was vacant. The landlady was no longer as hawkishly watchful as, she's been, as she had been at the start, though every now and then she still came out to stare. Only after pouring the coffee did Ava notice the view. It had rained during a recent cold spell and the air had cleared. The city looked scrubbed and clean and its concrete maze seemed delicate and even fragile, cradled by a ring of green hills. Above the hills were the dark, jagged mountains she'd seen at the resort at the stakeholders' meeting. And above those mountains shimmered squat snow peaks. She couldn't believe how close the Himalayas were. What a country this was, she thought. What a strange, difficult, complicated country. By now she'd caught up on the background reading and the indicators in relation to women were distressing. Women lagged behind men in health, education, income, mobility, opportunity, political representation. Many of the national laws violated international law. The statute of limitation on rape was three months and the new constitution, if it were ever going to be drafted at all, was likely to deny women equal citizenship rights. Nepali culture remained defiantly patriarchal. To add to this, Nepal's citizenry was divided into more than 100 identity groups. Women's indicators varied widely by economic class, but also by their caste, indigenous, and regional identities. Good morning, my dear. Tomas came out, rumpled and disheveled. He sat down beside her and poured himself a coffee. Ah, look, Ganesh Himal. It looks close, doesn't it? But it's up near the Tibet border. Oh, tell me you've climbed it, Ava smiled. I had to give up climbing after I broke my leg in the Wakhan corridor. She gave him a look. He shrugged. Some friends were going. I tagged along, but I had to be rescued. It was really embarrassing. How could she not like him? Hey, Tomas, she said. Yes, my dear? About last night. You should have kicked me out. He raised his hands, proclaiming his Im innocence. I hope I didn't, um, you know, no. Well, our spouses will be relieved to hear that. He was married? He explained. Violetta and I are awaiting for an annulment. In any case, I've taken a vow of celibacy. Things were getting out of hand. I had to stop. Ava couldn't help but feel a twinge of disappointment. Tomas said, hey, did you mean it when you said you'd be up for a trek in the spring? Have we discussed this? She asked. Remember last night at the rocks? It'll have to be an easy trek because of my knee, maybe lung tongue. With a yawn, he stretched, his shirt riding up to expose his shapely belly. So what's for breakfast, my dear? There's leftover dalbhat in the fridge. No, let's go to the organic market, he said, standing up. I'll introduce you to Richard and Louisa. He's Australian, she's Argentinian. They have a goat farm, and they make cheese with a method from the Ardennes. A day that began with Tomas would surely end on another tear. Another time, Ava said, of course. He leaned into Kisha on her cheek. Thank, uh, see you later, my dear. Ava watched him amble away, feeling a little sorry for herself. Tomas was her only friend in Nepal. They hadn't talked about her adoption, but the fact that he knew about it, it made her feel close to him somehow, though in truth she hardly knew him. Did an annulment mean that he was an observing Catholic? Hari her darted out of the servant's quarter to open the gate for Tomas. Tomas stopped to talk to the skinny guard. He'd taken language lessons and could speak what he called Bazar Nepali. He wasn't tall, but he towered over the guard. Tomas patted the guard on the shoulder and left. After closing the gate, Harihar turned to Ava. His expression was, what was that? He was slack-jawed. Ava stared at him, startled. Was he judging her for having a man over in her own house? Out of the corner of an eye, she caught a flash of red. Mrs. Thapa had come out to her balcony. An odd emotion, shame, crept through Ava. It quickly converted into anger. Was she expected to conform to Nepal's social mores? Why should she? and she deserved privacy. She was paying enough for this house. The rent had seemed reasonable to her when she had signed the contract, but Tomas had blanched when he'd found out how high it was. I'm going to have to intervene, he'd said. He had since loaned Ava books like Lords of Poverty, White Man's Burden, The Bottom Billion, Dead Aid, and two books by William Easterly, Sharp Critiques of Aid, which Thomas, Thomas derided as the aid industry. Tomas himself lived in a small apartment in an unassuming part of town, though he earned just as much as Ava. It wasn't as though he couldn't afford a house like this. It was just a difference of lifestyle. What he saved on rent, he splurged on satisfying his wanderlust. The clarity of the morning was fading. Ganesh Himal was disappearing into the usual gray fog. Mrs. Thapa was still staring. Ava got it up and went in. She had to comb through WDS Nepal's proposal this weekend, ahead of a meeting with its largest partner, National Network Nepal. 
The proposal was so big and so ambitious that it intimidated Ava. She had asked Claire Ross Jones, her boss, for permission to conduct an assessment before approving the grant. Claire had asked her to write a one-pager arguing her case. Ava needed to send the one-pager to Claire on Monday. But when she sat down to work, she realized she was still irritated about the guard, about the landlady, about this mansion she lived in. She was halfway down the hill by the time Harihar scrambled to the gate. Picking her way past a pile of garbage by the neighbor's house, she walked down to the main road where a cab sidled up to her. Taxi, taxi, taxi. The driver looked 10 years old. No, she said. Taxi, sister. The driver grew baleful. Sister, sister, and taxi. Okay, okay. Ava got in. Can you take me to Bal Mandir? She hesitated over the name. Then, as she'd seen Thomas do, she tried to bargain. How much? And 400 rupees, sister. Unlike Thomas, she couldn't haggle over what amounted in the end to four dollars. Okay, she said. Okay, the driver cried as they started off. And you, which country from, sister? Canada. And Sister Canada is too far. He launched into a spirited, if garbled, conversation, and she answered his questions politely. Yes, it's far. Yes, it's nice. I like Nepal, too. It's also nice. Till he stalled for a lack of a vocabulary. Then the driver turned on the radio and sang along to a Nepali pop song, careening through the pocked, bumpy streets, swerving to avoid pedestrians and motorbikes. A sharp stench arose as they crossed a bridge. Ava looked out in alarm at the befouled Bagmati River, which trickled down like an open sore, rank and infected. How could people put up with this? They shot past a stretch of government buildings, the National Archives, the Supreme Court, Parliament House. The center of town had wide streets and large glass front shop fronts. She saw a crowd forming around a man, a performer of some kind. At the intersection, a woman traffic police waved them on, her face hidden behind a dust mask. Two middle-aged women at the bus stop were poring over a newspaper. A motorcyclist whizzed past the cab, barricade, loaded down with a family of four. This, Ava thought, was what she had barricaded herself against that Christmas when she was 14, when she had come with her mom and dad and her brother Luke. All this, she hadn't wanted any of this to bear a relation to her. Back in a less central part of town, the dri driver announced, Bal Mandir! Ava tensed up reflexively as he drove through an open metal gate. She was thirsty from last night's excesses. She should have brought a bottle of water. The driver halted in front of a rambling old palace. And waiting here, sister? No, Ava said, and then changed her mind. Actually, yes, could you wait? Petrol too big price today, and 900 rupees. Okay, just wait for me here, it won't be long. The orphanage wasn't quite the crumbling wreck she had remembered as it as. It was palatial if run down, and it was ornate, decorated with columns, arches, and balustrades. There were two entrances, each flanked by Greek-style fluted columns with Corinthian capitals. The paint on the facade was chipping, as it was on the doors and windows, but there was a faded grandeur to the building. There was no one on the front lawn. Ava remembered the children who had been there that Christmas, how they had stared at her. That old wound prickled inside. Behind her, a woman said, existential earth? She spun around and saw a young woman with brochures of some kind. Oh, I thought, isn't this Bal Mandir? Ava asked her. The woman pointed at one of the entrances. That is orphanage side. This, she pointed at the other entrance, is Academy of Arts side. She handed Ava a brochure. Please, you are welcome to see. Exhibition is on the theme Existential Earth. Oh, thank you. With a smile, the young woman went inside the Academy of Art. Ava turned back to the orphanage. The building was still. There was no movement in any of the windows. Where were the children? Not wanting to stand there too much longer, but not yet ready to leave, she went into the Academy of Art. Through the entrance was a large empty foyer with a stone floor. She remembered the stone floor from that Christmas and how cold the rooms had been. Dust motes swirled in a beam of light from a side window. There was a sign pointing upstairs. The wooden staircase creaked as she climbed. The art show was two floors up. It opened dramatically with a life-size effigy suspended in thick black rope. There was a television screen behind the effigy, and it displayed a woman also suspended, swaying back and forth in the air. Sometimes the woman raised her hands as if trying to fly, and at other times she flailed, unable to find her footing. Ava took a picture of the installation, emailed it to her brother Luke, who's an artist. Look, little brother, there's conceptual art in Nepal. The rest of the show consisted of what Luke would dismiss as retinal art. 
landscape, figurative paintings, abstractions. Ava noted the prevalence of Hindu imagery. There were several gods from the pantheon which she didn't recognize, certainly not in these interpretive renditions. There were too many paintings to really take in. They blurred together after a while. She saw a balcony on the far side of the hall and stepped out onto it. It looked over an inner courtyard of the building with an enclosed yard below. The yard may have been part of the orphanage. There was a boy there, and he looked about seven or eight. He had on a school uniform, but no shoes. Ava watched as he raised his arms and hurled himself into a cartwheel, letting out a triumphant whoop as he landed on his feet. He raised his arms again and was about to do another cartwheel when someone called him and he ran in. She remembered what the official at the orphanage had said about her. Mother child passed in childbirth. Father is unknown. Name was given for official purposes. Ava. She didn't know why she'd come back here, but she was sort of glad she had. When she turned back in, the woman who'd given her the brochure was standing directly behind her. Oh, I didn't notice you, Ava said. Sorry. Please, you are wel welcome. The woman seemed sweet. She was young, in her early twenties or perhaps late teens. That is by me, she said, pointing at a pedestal with a small carmby. You're one of the artists? I am youth artist of Nepal. Ava went to look at her carving. It was maybe ten inches high and made of clay. It was of a woman, maybe, though it wasn't clear. The style was naive. It had a kind of raw energy. It is, it is, the artist struggled with her English. It is mother. Your mother? Ava asked. Or did she mean a universal mother figure? My mother lives living in Kirtipur, the artist said. It is not portrait of her, but my imagination. Oh, Ava wasn't sure what that meant. It's an interesting piece, she said. The artist smiled shyly. Checking the brochure for a title, there was none. Ava caught the price and on a whim decided, you know what, I'd like to buy it. She decided it would be a memento of her visit or of her return to the orphanage. The sculptor's eyes widened in delight. Oh, I appreciate very much your support. It is a big support. Thank you for buying. Oh, I am so happy. She got into a tizzy over the payment, writing up a receipt, counting Ava's money, making change. She cradled Ava's business card in her palms as though it were a precious gift. I will deliver myself, she said. I will deliver to your house after exhibition. With a glee that bo both gratified and embarrassed Ava, she placed a red dot beside the piece. Oh, I am very happy today. Only once back in the foyer did Ava realize that she'd left behind the brochure. She hadn't asked and the sculptor hadn't told her her name. Was it a Nepali thing not to introduce yourself by name? Outside, she, look a she took a final look at the orphanage. She was done here. She'd never come back. When she got into the cab, the driver said, Too long waiting, sister. And 1,000 rupees, okay? Ten dollars. Ava said, okay. She badly needed a drink of water. As they started off, she checked her email. Her brother Luke hadn't replied to her. It was the middle of the night in Miami. She didn't really want to go back home. She needed a distraction, any distraction. So she called Tomas. Hey, how was the organic market? I picked up two soft cheeses, a semi-soft with truffles and a hard blue. What are you doing for lunch, my dear? A cheese platter wouldn't go amiss. Well, come over. I found a cab so from Margaret River in my corner shop. I'll open it so we can breathe, so it can breathe. That's a section of the novel. There's a lot of, everyone is just in the middle of their life. Um, as Ava is, she's uh, coping with a lot of different things. And my goal was really to try and find a way to make them all sort of hit up against each other and uh, sort of make each other change directions a little bit um, to sort of show this sort of intersected world that we're all living in, whether or not we directly know each other, how we do affect each other. So, thanks. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here in this um, special land. Thank you, uh, Zringla and uh, Mark and Sarah, for inviting me here. And also um, to, um, um, to all of you for being here. I'm going to be reading from some new work, poetry, and some of the old pieces. 
the new work is really, uh, I think, um, helping me balance myself because so much of my time right now is spent in thinking about my dissertation and writing my dissertation. And I thought that because I've been writing for so long that it would be, uh, you know, not that difficult. <laughs> but I, um, I've realized that it's a very different kind of writing and I haven't had training in that. And so um, it's been quite challenging, but also very um, enjoyable in its own way. So writing poetry helps um, just sort of center myself and think about the topic and the themes from a slightly different angle. So, Home, a transitive. The nation's monuments are made of enduring stuff. We are obstinate ink stain, memory, an animal whose simile, similes lose scale. If story is a wavelength, we could pick a beginning, follow intention to the border, and then let custom reign. When we build a nation, we are permanently old and always new. Mother died a refugee. She thought the status was a promise of return. She had a vision, a version of nation under the bread. Never mind that her village took a new name. The jar of water from her childhood's river, ten stones and five twigs were clues that home was transitive. Two, heart muscles begin their dirge during a heart attack. Oxidization is linked to regeneration, which is also to say words build their own web within a system. She said, all disease starts in the colon. She knows where oxygen is stored in the building. She knows who needs it most. Sometimes it is given to the ones who will heal quickest. In time, new tissue granulates the wound, pattern of tiny cells visible on the sun's surface through a telescope or cumulus clouds or dandelion clocks. The edges of a wound shrink over time around a scar that, like maps, tell an incomplete story. Three. One of us is a faucet reconciling to the temperature of indifference. This is the world. The drawer assembled by you pinches a finger before yielding. There are so many foreigners here, I said. When first I stepped onto a beach in Virginia, I had an idea of the ocean and of who I was. I am in water now, attempting to see the ocean. We lick our wounds with the same tongue. Long accustomed to carrying a gauze for shield, the heart wraps bruises like dumplings. I see the sun through my neighbor's window, welked in lace. Is this what we mean when we use the word virtual? Tulips grow even after they're cut. The ones I loved, having died without returning, crowd the heart's waiting room. To start all over again is to imagine the world is as it is. I give up. I thought this was a poem about nation. The one she began at 19, the one she waits to return to, her eyes never adjusting to the colors of exile. This antechamber, this long incision called hope. Last night I crossed to the other side, unwelcome territory. I might have been sad. I'd been observing then the sun's influence subjugated by streetlights imitating moonlight. Even the sun softens, I had thought to myself, to bring every image in view as a memory of some other place, some other text. Last night, I slept in a borrowed bed for guests I anticipated, as host to self's solitary marriage. I examined the world thus, and later, standing at the precipice, I awoke. Even sleep did not take me back. Um, I'll read from the books. So my eyes are now um, changing. So if I stumble over words, it's just because they're just getting blurred. 
But if I wear my reading glasses, then every time I look up, I get dizzy. You know, so, <laughs> so this is age. <laughs> so I'm just pretending I can see perfectly fine. I can see mostly my text. <laughs> Rules of the house. As remembered, I'm only beginning to understand how seasons affect me. Winter, snow beating street people into obedience, how mothers held back from stepping out in discreetly ornamented shoes and thin nylon socks. This is the way I count years. The winters we had fire and the summers we erased because we were in another place. I'm told I was five in 1971, even though my birth certificate states I was born in 1969. The elders count on their fingers. They have done it for a long time. It was winter, but not the kind of winter they were born into. They were wearing hand-knitted woolen sweaters. I was wearing a jacket that children born to refugees wear. When I am with them, I cannot say I remember. I say, as I am told, I remember. It is not the accuracy of the story that concerns us, but who gets to tell it. First lesson. Men love silence in women, said Aunt Paper. Pema, use fingers to count the years of the sun, graze lips against its first advance. When tea is cold, allow to spill. What comes warm is good warm. The right hand needs barley. Left washes your bottom. The rest is fate. Second lesson. The newspaper showed a boy drinking from the sky, water rested in his clavicle. M said he was not the kind her daughter would marry. Tashi wanted to know if rain had harmful elements in it. M said decent girls stayed clear of rain. When it is hot, undress in the dark, go to the roof. If the monsoon clouds appear, wish farmers well. Mothers teach their daughters to pick the best tomatoes, shy to the touch, surface of cement. Tashi asks if husbands are picked the same way. Sunspot on cheeks, wash with rose water, pluck under your arm. S held his penis and ran around the tree saying he was blessing it. The elder roared with laughter and said he would grow up to be a wild one. S was blessed free from the cycle of female births. M taught us to peel an apple without disturbing it, saying time and again how important it was to concentrate on the knife. This is an example of a good woman. Um, so I'll read a few poems from my second book, which is In the Absent Every Day. Um, I think that there's a recurring theme, um, but my poems get shorter, and so I think the focus gets a little lost sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a slightly different poem. Right. Surrender. Between the three of us, we had a garden of camellias. The whites were planted in the middle. By the time we changed our minds, the plants had taken root, and we took it as another lesson. The doctor often found something wrong in one of us. We assumed we'd grow feeble before old. Raindrops left puddles on our clothes laid out, flattening the grass into our shapes. They would dry, but again, there was nothing we took for granted. If the sun came out, if thieves climbed our gates, if naked spirits tucked damp shirts into their porous ribs. On our side of the town, we referred to fluctuations in our collective karma for predictions for weather. We had many ways to introduce ourselves. We said, where are you going and have you eaten today? In my family, decisions are made by the Lama who dreams. The gardener who is rotten way is not as lucrative as the gardener whose garden grows tomatoes. After all, we're living through a conjecture. Wiser to say sorry within the alternatives of a moment and read the display of toes as a scent. 
Men are men because we know. The men in my family hope to return to a country they, they left in their youth. They say home and point away from the cement rooms they have built. At home, they say, the grass was tall, the milk was sweet. At home, there was no need for sugar. The youngest in the family died during the year of his obstacles. A pilgrimage to four holy sites and seven offerings proved otios, but Doma, the family dog, survived a fall. Once a year, the girls on our street worshipped their brothers with offerings of flowers and vermilion powder, remembering that brothers will one day take wives. We wish to know the ordeals of all beings we pray for, amphibians, crocodiles, what of oranges hanging like bats, their discomfort in being ripe. What perpendicular roots we've formed in this, our neighbor's motherland. The departed will return, but that's not necessarily good. To be born a human is a commendable feat, the elders say, marking a forehead with black soot to keep evil eyes away. Um, and I'll end from this book with this short poem. The mountain air must see time as passing in present. The elders say times have changed, as though they'd forgo a year if it were up to them. Days grow in them like a potato. They see their body as a map to the country's center from where the young never return the same. Nothing is spectacular without a reference, or does that change? Snow traps everything for a while. The river stops flowing. Um, I'll just read, a, read a, two short poems from uh, My Rice Tastes, the, Tastes Like the Lake. Um, I, was, I was trying in this um, text to really maybe get away from writing about exile, you know, and sort of focus on something else. And I was looking at um, um, the way of the bodhisattva, you know, and I thought, oh, maybe I can sort of, you know, see what I understand and then work with that. Um, and then I realized um, that was quite impossible to understand, right? So these sort of poems were engaging with some of the concepts, um, um, but then I realized I'd have to sort of abandon and uh, study that for a lifetime, right? Mm -hmm. So these are sort of engaging with some of the ideas of um, the mind and perception. My rice tastes like the lake. It is not everyone's desire to swim as a fish. I have a little dog that behaves like a cat. It is not his fault he cannot pass the discipline test. A fault line runs through the city center, sullen as a stretch mark under a dress. We believe our undoing comes from one source. An escape plan is our solace. There are words, there are stories we never tell. She said on the radio, my rice tastes like the lake. It was a perfect sentence. Alas, attachment is a mother tongue. In mother's dictum, all objects serve a task. An antique table has form but lacks height, so it stays a secret. Our duty, we learn early, tethered to the custom of old country patience within discussions of internal time. The air is good for caution and for discussing, dis displaying ancestral leanings, but even that presupposes tact. For 49 days, we seek to bring the dead to awareness. It is words again that lead them astray. And rituals betray a desire to propitiate my own thoughts, to be perfect so as to be misinterpreted. That's the last one. Insofar as a hair clip reveals a potential for flourishes or a rubber band gathers the way... Sorry, I'll begin again. My eyes are getting a little... Um, sort of words are blurring into each other. Insofar as a hair clip reveals a potential for flourishes or a rubber band gathers in the way the family cannot, a spectacular stone for stone is everywhere is surrendered to an idea. 
On its own, it too is not alone. I am not the same to you as I am to me, and there lives a solitude. Windows turn blue at dusk when each household selects a drama they watch from afar. The world, such a pretentious word, but there it is, circling inside and outside clouds part and align as to suggest they too are at liberty. In the dark or in its shadows, I liken myself to a room where I see what I come to know. Thank you so much. Am I allowed to unsettle these books? Do it bad. They shouldn't go on the floor. So um, <laughs> this is, in so many ways, the most intimate and personal event we've ever had through the Himalaya program. And I'd like to thank all three of you for making it so. It's, um, it's very right also to that you should have started off with what you did. Because this is so much, in my mind, a story of layers and waves of translation. Every decoding being like another encoding. And a few thoughts have just struck me as you've spoken and shared so beautifully. Uh, so you yourself run a public-facing website that really is all about translating. And when you get to this idea that people speak languages which they don't necessarily read, we get into very interesting questions of who has the authority of voice, which it's not the accuracy of the story, but who gets to tell it? Mm -hmm. What better way of describing a patient dissertation? Um, <laughs> and I was wondering two things, really, for each of you, which is, is the story of exile somehow inescapably the story of permanent translation? And for Manju, and I don't know if this is a presumption, but given how much you've done to explain worlds that you've come from to others and you've just undertaken this formidable translation of probably the most complex written Nepali there is to translate. Has your work been back translated into Nepali? Mm -hmm. Uh, translated into Nepali. Um, it's the non-fiction uh, biography of Chandraguru, uh, and it's uh, probably the most straightforward reportage book I've written, uh, but I was glad that it was that book because I think that's information that and a kind of history that was lost to us that that was important, but um, outside of that, no. That's a very profound question you've asked. I'm still Thanks. trying to understand what it means. But I guess I would answer at this moment, you know, um, that writing, you can think of writing itself, right, as always a translation. So in that context, yeah, maybe yes. But exile itself is so painful, right, in many ways. And I think that aspect of it, um, Yeah, I don't know if, if 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 the word of translation would be the right word, you know? Um. Can I just ask you something just to follow up on this? Because uh, in, sorry, this is very loud. In, <laughs> in one of the um, poems you had uh, handed out to us beforehand uh, called Revolute, there's a line that says, someone like me is never coming home. and. You know, when I read a lot of the poems that you sent me in advance and um, hearing you talk now, one of the thing, things I think about is how, is feminist uh, theory, literary theory, about how um, a lot of language is 
like the scar tissue that covers over the wound um, that we're trying to address. And a lot of your work has to do with language itself, whether it's about you know, the, the language structure of English that you're writing in, so transitive, or you know, the sentences that, you're, that you refer to in your own poems. Um, so to me, it, it, it's, my response to your poetry was that it sounds like that's the home that you can never return to is the wound, and language is the scar tissue that's, you know, that, that you're using to heal that wound. Is that too reductive a reading of your work? Oh, no, I think, I mean, I think that that's, that's certainly, I think, one way of reading it, right? But I think language is also the space that's creating home in a weird way, right? Or that is the home that you can build. You know, yeah. yeah, although it is, yeah. Um, See, I'm not used to talking about my own work. <laughs> I'm being asked. I'm always reading somebody else's work and trying to figure it out. <laughs> so it feels like I feel very happy and special, but it's hard to. I mean, you must. Yeah, um, yeah. No. Yeah. No, I mean, it seemed to me also because you said yeah. we are an obstinate, we are obstinate ink stain memory. Yeah, yeah. So language is your home, English, the English think, language. It is, right? And I think home itself, I think the way, the way that I see it, home itself is so complicated, right? When you ask a Tibetan, um, where's home, mm -hmm. right? They're thinking immediately, the first response is, oh, Nepal, India. But then they'll say, I'm a Tibetan, right? So sort of Tibet remains, in some ways, the aspired to home or um, maybe the eventual home, but it's, it's there as a, as a home that's always, um, what is it, like deferred, right? It's a deferred state in some ways, but we don't quite understand it because over time that has changed too. Like all these years, every year, I think there's a shift in how we um, view home, but we're not able to articulate at the moment, right? Because it takes so long to understand where you are, why you're living through this experience, and we're moving from Kathmandu to San Francisco to you know um, Canada. Depends on moving so much. Uh, so I think that sort of layer of um, complication is not addressed yet, and I think we're still finding a way to talk about it. Right. So that's why I think it's a it's it's a that, that, that the language becomes a wound, but it's also, you know, it's also covering the wound, it is the wound. Um, I think we're still figuring it, figuring out how to talk about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Or at least I am. <laughs> <laughs> but to me it seems like, um, I mean, one of the things I love about hearing or reading your poems uh, is that there's, they're impossible to reduce. There's a sort of very abstract language that runs through them, but there's also such the intimacy of the, you know, like the rice that tastes like the lake or the mother's gestures or the, the small cultural moments um, that everyone has in their everyday life. And I feel like one of the great advantages of poetry that, or great disadvantages of narrative writing is that narrative writing tends to always want to be reductive or run, rush to the plot or rush to you know the theme or something you know it, it I, and I feel like I have to struggle against that in my own uh, stories and novels to not reduce things to because life is not reductive and so it's the impossibility of really reducing everything that seems very regenerative in your poetry where you it's it's a, it's more like a landscape you're inhabiting with your language. Um, and not reducing everything to an idea or to you know a theme or to one one thing, um, whereas with fiction and with uh, linear, I think writing it's very easy to try and just force you know the story forward, the theme forward. And it's something I struggle with myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right because I think poetry allows you know for a lot of uncertainty that you don't expect or uh, you know in other texts, right? And poetry you can sort of sit with the uncertainties, the uncertainties themselves lend 
um, a particular valence, right, to the text, which I think in fiction that would be hard, I guess, right? Yeah. Um, to a certain extent, when you're dealing with characters and plot, um, there's a certain movement, whereas in poetry you can just sort of just sit, I think, in, in, in a particular place without yeah. necessarily, yeah. you know, um, moving and it lends itself to being still in a way that in novels and other texts you sort of moved along, right? Yeah. Um, so you're right about that, you know. Yeah. But what I really wanted to ask you when I was reading your work, because you work in so many different genres, and I thought, like, do you... And you, like, as you said, um, you know, this afternoon and now, that you think about a theme and you think about um, an idea, and then you sort of um, work on the character, the plot, and so the story comes afterwards, right? So, um, when you're when you're choosing how you want to write or what you want to write, um, do you also choose the the genre very specifically in that way? Like, are there some themes and topics that lend themselves more easily to um, fiction, and some do not fiction? Does that also play yeah. in your decision? I think it's. I, I think they do. Uh, I th I would never want to write a novel about. Nepali contemporary events, like political events. <laughs> I think it would be too hard to get into the mind of a political actor, let's say, or, or something like that. Uh, whereas uh, for me, it's easier to get into the mind of uh, a character who's suffering through the current condition. But I, it, it would be hard for me to write about um, politics or human rights abuses the way I have about nonfiction. Uh, uh, so, uh, so I do think some things, some subjects lend themselves to certain genres more. One thing I do want to do in my own writing, particularly going forward, is again sort of resist this, the narrative structure a little bit more because I think there are writers who, who do that and who can break the narrative structure and, um, and that is more true to life and how we live and our lived experience um, and it's something that that I always struggle with. So th th that's something, particularly going forward, if I want to write about more and more disempowered characters, I want to work more silence into the text, I want to work more uncertainty, and as you say, freedom, because I think a non-narrative structure just allows you more freedom. Uh, the reader's expectation is not set, uh, that you know, there, here's going to be a plot, and the plot is going to be resolved in some way. So if you're not setting up that structure early on, then you have so much freedom as a writer. Um, so that's, those are things I, I think about a lot, and, and I'm thinking about right now as I'm beginning to put together an outline for a new novel. And can, you, can you tell us a little bit about your new novel? I, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I don't have anything <laughs> other than the concept. So this is, it's very early stages, and I do work, uh, I tend to write novels of ideas, um, and I tend to decide, you know, because every novel is going to take me about four or five years, which, you know, is a long time to spend with one body of work. And so it's got to be something that's big enough and engages m both my mind and my emotions. And I know that at the end of five years, I will not be tired of this, that I'll, I'll still have the energy to stay with it for that long. So I know that I want to work on the issue of citizenship. Um, uh, the the issue of citizenship in for Nepali women being unequal to the citizenship of men and the the sort of privileging of the male bloodline that uh, the Nepali constitution has done. Uh, so I know I want that to be the center of the novel, but uh, there is no way you know you can't write that without thinking through the characters and coming up with the characters. So right now I'm in this blue sky period of really trying to think through who would be the vehicle for that story, how would that story be structured, how would that be uh, an interesting story, because we all know that, you know, I mean, I could write a small essay that, you know, an 800 word essay that explains what is the problem with the citizenship laws, but that wouldn't be the point. So the point would be to immerse the reader in a, um, a story of a few characters that leaves them really feeling uh, the problem and really feeling the, the loss and the pain and the sort of um, uh, 
injustice of this. So I'm just putting it together. So I can't really say anything about it other than here's you know the concept that I'm I want to work with. Um, but I mean, do you? How do you start? Do you start with? I mean, so one of the things when I hear your work, particularly when you read it, is that the voice is so uh, identifiably yours. And so, it, do you start with voice? Do you start with themes? I mean, you also work with very large themes, you know, yeah. big ideas of loss and displacement and home. And I think I start with an image. You know, mm. even for short stories, I have. I, I have nothing but an image, and it begins with um, an image. Mm -hmm. And my short stories are terrible; like they go nowhere. You know, <laughs> 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 like my poetry, they just begin and then like it stopped. <laughs> 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 but but it's usually an image. I, I see something, and um, mm. I go there. Yeah. Mm. And with poetry, very often, or it can be just a single word. Um, and often it's also yeah, and it can be after reading somebody else's work, you know, something lingers, yeah. and then just one word will start it. So um, it's, it's not very organized in some way. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think that's the problem with writing a novel is uh, there might be some writers who can do it without plotting it through, mm -hmm. thinking it through, structuring it, but in general with a novel, if you don't have a structure mm -hmm. when you start out, you will get lost in the side branches. And so the trick for me has always been to try and have that start, you know, be very clear about what I'm writing and then leave space to be surprised and for things to change and grow and, mm -hmm. and shift. So that happens a lot. But um, yeah, it, it's, if you know you're going to be writing a 70,000 word book, then you know it needs a certain structure, you know? It's, it would be very hard for me to go in open-ended into a large book, whereas stories you can write in an open-ended way mm -hmm. much more. Yeah. Or I can, sorry. <laughs> Shall we open up the floor? No. Uh, thank you both for very uh, interesting readings and uh, comments. I'm curious, do you, uh, when you write, do you think about who's going to read your work? Do you have a sort of image of your reader? Or, and if, if so, what is that? Who are they? Um, I think for poetry, it's different. You know, uh, when I write poems, I, um, I'm thinking of a solitary person. You know, someone, uh, because my poems, I think, are so quiet. Uh, even as I write them, I, I think the voice is very, very intimate and very quiet. So I always think just of a single person, um, whoever it is who's listening. So I, I don't have an idea of who it is, but just, just one year or, you know, half a year or something, right? Um, when I wrote the nonfiction book, um, I, I was writing it for Tibetans because I felt I would have liked uh, a book that talked about Tibet from the perspective of a Tibetan. Right? What does it mean to, to think about home when you've never been in that space or you know, when your whole life is structured around that absent space? So how do you, how do you think about it? How, what do you, how do you relate to it? Right? Um, what is Tibet? So I wanted to have those answers when I was growing up and all the books were written by um, you know, non-Tibetans or adventurers or you know, whoever who um, I I wasn't certain if if that really conveyed how I felt growing up in India and Nepal. Um, so for me, the audience was definitely um, Tibetan um, for, for 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 coming home to Tibet. I think um, for me, I, I I do think about the audience in the very last drafts. Mm -hmm. because that's, I think primarily I write and I think a lot of writers write to solve puzzles in our own head and, mm -hmm. and figure things out for ourselves and maybe like order the world, you know, mm -hmm. answer some question to ourselves. But in the very final drafts, um, 
it is important that it speaks to an audience or to a reader. Um, I do think about it. It's been this process of editing, you know, what has been published in South Asia in English into a Canadian sort of audience's expectations has been interesting in that way because it's a different exercise in trying to figure out who that audience is who would be reading this, who wouldn't understand it. Because I think I write for someone like myself who is familiar with South Asia and who um, obviously reads English but is culturally very familiar with South Asia. So that's the audience I've always geared myself towards. I've also al always wanted to write with the complexity of a Nepali writer. So, you know, again, if you're reading Nepali literature written in Nepali, there are so many assumptions that the writer makes fairly that, you know, the reader will understand these cultural references, these terms, you know, all of this. When you write in English, it's a little displaced already because you have to make that decision. Are you going to, for example, when I was translating Indrabhadra Rai, the, you know, pan comes up, so, you know, the pan shop. And someone read it and didn't understand what pan was, right? Which is, to me, like, that's not... It would never have occurred to me that someone didn't, wouldn't understand what pan is. So I think if you're writing in English, it's already a little bit displaced and you already make the decision to write your food terms, your clothes terms in Nepali, you know, your didi bai, dazu baini, all of that in Nepali. So you're already mixing in that language. Um, so, yeah, for me, this, this has been a strange exercise in questioning every decision that I would naturally have sort of already resolved in South Asia. Um. That uh, happens even in the writing of non-fiction. Yeah. I did note it in the writing experience that some writers have to say, yeah. have to put to some description, roasting by the flowers. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything to your reader. So, and for a Tibetan reader, you would just know somewhere, somewhere, you don't need to be this. And in that describing also, it gets into some lot of popular misdescriptions. Mm -hmm. you know, um, they say jack butter cheese and say jack don't give milk. <laughs> so jack cheese don't give milk. <laughs> but somehow, and also in my writings in Kathmandu, they keep saying he's telling this yak hair coat or yak hair to try to. So eventually it's not this, no yak hair coat. <laughs> it will be so coarse to wear. But somehow marketing is everything's yak butter tea, yak. <laughs> Uh, so, but this is completely misdescribed. You have to send it by misdescribing it. <laughs> because the uh, real description will uh, not be understood or yeah. While we're on this, um, just because it struck me as something so sort of unusual that you were describing, Manju, about different editions of books, um, a South Asian edition and then a North American edition coming out. Can I ask, are you sort of de-Nepalifying or are you North Americanizing? In other words, are, are you turning the tea shop into a Dunkin' Donuts? <laughs> I presume not. Or were you just thinking to the reader, what don't they know and what bits do I have to kind of explain them? Because in a way, you're, it's another form of meta-translation. You're creating a new book. Yeah, it, 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 it is interesting. And again, it's unfamiliar to me. It's my first time of doing this, but... Um, one of the things that I, my editor suggested that I agree with is, so I have a lot of different characters in the novel, and the editor has suggested starting each character's section with that name several times. So in the North American way that, and I think this is a cultural thing, how North Americans really make it a point to remember people's names, whereas I feel like I'm from a culture where I can have known people for years and don't really know their names. Mm -hmm. um, and you just call them Dai or Didi, or, yeah. you know, and it's years of, of that kind of thing. Um, so I feel like that was uh, some something very concrete to help non-South Asian readers just have the name stick in their minds. Um, but outside of that, there are a couple of structural changes too. Mm -hmm. So not, not just these small stylistic changes, but a couple of structural changes just to help the North American reader with the complex, entering the complexity of that world. Mm -hmm. um, so I can't assume that familiarity that I do. Um, so I don't know, I don't, I'm certainly not North America-fying it. Mm -hmm. um, 
I'm not giving, I'm trying not to give up on any of the complexity, uh, but I'm trying to make it more accessible to someone who wouldn't be familiar with it. So it's a little bit more like explaining things a little bit more, you know? Yeah. Um, I'm just, even if I was late, I'm so, I'm so I apologize, I, I'm so glad I came. This is just a wild melange of new ideas for me. <laughs> I'm just I'm trying to pull apart what I want to ask. But the simplest thing I want to ask is you seem bilingual. Both of you are just so, you know, you have such expertise with English and such a way of so that would be my first question: Is your first language English or Tibetan and Nepali, or do you, did you grow up with both at once? Um, it, it is English now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have the skill that Manjushri has, you know, in, in sort of in, in Nepali, right? Um, I can speak Nepali, I can speak Tibetan, I can speak Hindi, but I don't really write in any of those oh. languages, and I I can't also read, um, uh, you know, in a critical way. So I, I read, I write English now and I read mostly in English. Yeah. Mm. For me, uh, English is my first language. Uh, just my family lived in Canada when I was two years old, so I picked it up. <laughs> um, Nepali, I actually, uh, I suppose it, it feels more like a mother tongue, so it does feel like there's this emotional store of language. Um, but it is not the language I primarily write in. I can read Nepali and I made it a real effort to be able to read Nepali. I had to take lessons and because Nepali grammar is very, uh, Nepali, written Nepali is very formal and spoken Nepali is very informal, which is not the, so much the case in English. Um, so I had to make a real effort to learn it, but I don't write in it. Um, I don't, I tried to write in it, but I thought life is too short and I should just translate. Yeah. I could <laughs> make myself useful by translating instead of um, writing in Nepali and you know, just by writing in English. So English is my first language. So there's multiple resonances of language through your work and it seems like listening to you that those resonances from the language almost like they, they bring their own network of images with them of the diff different levels and it's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. You know, um, yeah. Thank you. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah. That is true. Yeah. Yeah. For the longest time when I was in the U.S., I always felt I was in Kathmandu. <laughs> you know, I, I it, it never went away. The feeling that I was, I was, I was not here, even though I was here, and I carried that feeling for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> She asked a question. Okay. <laughs> you guys are <laughs> um, Kind of related to the conversation that's going on about um, like North America tying the book. Um, <laughs> sure. Um, so my, my main question is, uh, this might be specifically for the monetary, the, the, because you're someone who writes not, uh, fiction about stuff that is contemporary enough that you have very strong views about it, how do you juggle, like, being a fiction writer with, um, like, some polemical or didactic impulses that you might get about? <laughs> 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 I have very strong opinions on something. Um, or you might, like, have, like, five parenthetical statements saying that you were wearing a sari went to a pan shop with, like, you know, explain what a sari is, <laughs> and explain what pan is. Um, um, so, just your process about that. You know, I, I actually decided uh, about maybe maybe ten or maybe fewer years ago, maybe seven years ago, to stop writing op-eds um, because I felt like doing so and having my opinion, you know, while you know I felt like I I could write decent op-eds. I felt that it was putting me into a space of reducing things. Um, into very clear thoughts, which is important and that has its own value, so um, someone should do it, but I didn't feel like it was productive to my creative process because I feel like one of the things that art should do is ask questions and disturb people and move people and have them come to their own answers instead of 
telling people, here's the problem and here's the solution, mm -hmm. which is, I think, the job and a very important job of someone else to do. Mm -hmm. So I found um, that uh, it was also putting me in a position of trying to explain Nepal too much, and I didn't want that. I wanted to go back into a more personal voice and a more personal and more puzzled experience, which is how I actually experience it. Um, and so since then, I've basically only written very personal essays and just stayed away from opining, as, <laughs> as um, South Asians would call it. Um, and it, I don't know if I'll return to it. I feel like the personal voice is quieter and, and less valued in some way, but I think it's, if you're a creative person, that is the more important voice to listen to. Um, I have friends who really hate me for having done this, you know, who really think it was just a cop-out and, you know, nobody reads fiction, like, you know, it doesn't matter, right? <laughs> if you write a novel about citizenship, who's going to read that? If I understood it correctly, you said um, you don't want to get into the mind of politicians and get into political actors and, and incorporate that in your novel, but can you actually, how can you write about citizenship in a country like Nepal without getting into the mind of politicians and you know, the, the political history of the country itself? So. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think it's possible to do it in, like, to, to have the person who is who is uh, experiencing the problem of citizenship not be a powerful person. I think it would be very hard for me to write about a South Asian politician, Nepali politician, without caricaturing that person, um, because they, there's such a fundamental dishonesty to Nepali politics that I, I don't know if I would be able to do that and give that character the complexity that I think all characters should have so I don't, I just don't think I can do it. I'm, I'm too angry, I, I don't trust them, I don't understand them. You know, the same people who will sneakily get their own family members dual citizenship and work out everything in their family will publicly vote against equal citizenship for women. So I don't know how I would get into that without caricaturing and lampooning a character like that and I don't want to write in that way. I want to, whoever I'm writing about, I want to give that person the complexity that that person, that all people have. Um, so I think the way I would be able to do it is to write about someone who is a victim of the law. Yeah. More, more experience of the victim. More of that side, yeah. Uh, your, your reading reminded me, it took me back to years, brought back a lot of old memories of what time was the novel set? This one is set uh, very contemporary. It ends at the time that the new constitution is made. Well, Balmandir was destroyed by the earthquake, huh? mm -hmm. so this was it the old Balmandir. <laughs> it did yeah. bring a lot of questions to my mind. One is for immigrants like ourselves: what is home? Where is home? <laughs> Uh, that's a, I always had read the novel before coming here because I wanted to know, you know how we came, so what, what, how, what happens to an Alba and all of that, but mm -hmm. I'll let you all go and read that. Uh, it comes out in Canada next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are there any other thoughts, and comments, reflections? Please. Just a question. Um, it seems like you both sort of straddle two, world, two worlds in your writing. Um, do you find that you lean towards one, like, or influence more by one than the other, or is it pretty equal? Well, I don't know if I were to question about this. Mm -hmm. I think in terms of how I was formed as a writer, I was formed almost entirely by a Western education. Mm -hmm. I studied in the States, and um, so a lot of the literature that I read that I that moved me the most was either European literature in translation, like Russian or French, German, Spanish, or it was English literature and American literature. Um, so I feel like I was very much formed here, but my subjects and everything I still want to write about 
are all in Nepal. So for me, that's the the world I'm straddling. I don't know how what. I mean, I arrived to Nepali literature late when I was already working on my first novel. Then I began to read Nepali literature. Yeah, quite similar for me too. You know, I grew up. Uh, I, I studied in India, so um, I only read um, European novels. So even um, our syllabus for uh, English literature was was mostly um, you know European texts. And studying in India, we were never taught Indian um, literature, which is so ironical. I came away afterwards and then started reading <laughs> um, South Asian writers and um, even writers of uh, people of color. I never read that when I was in um, India. Um, so yeah, I still, I, I'm, the tradition that I write in, I guess, is not sort of, again, you know, the um, subject that I'm sort of dealing with, right? And even exile is dealt with so differently in Western texts. Um, so we don't have the, the Tibetan tradition of writing sort of anglophile, or if you look at like novels, right, it's very new, but writing in English is, is extremely new. So it's, um, yeah. Um, just a question coming back to what Saren said at the beginning. We um, called this event, uh, we gave it the title about contemporary Himalayan literatures. Um, so I would just like to ask both of you how you relate to that term, uh, Himalayan or Himalayan, right? Uh, it's somehow a regional term that puts Tibet and Nepal into a shared space or into conversation, perhaps. Um, but like Saren was saying, there was this debate on Facebook about well, why call uh, writing by a Tibetan author Himalayan, why call writing by a Nepali author Himalayan. I'm curious to know what it does or doesn't do for each of you. <laughs> Did we mess up? <laughs> <laughs> this is a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's wonderful. I hadn't thought about it, you know, um, because I've been put into so many different categories. Uh, we don't have really a space, right? So um, I've been it, it, all over the place, and and modern writers, I felt like, yeah, it, it, it is what we're writing. We we are writing from these different regions, talking to each other, right? But we're never given um, mm -hmm. the opportunity to speak from that position in some ways, right? Um, so, yeah. I, I did say, like, what is... Like, <laughs> like, is there one? I wasn't sure, right? So I had to, I had to Google. <laughs> what is... Like, is there a... Is there already a category that I wasn't aware of, you know? Because I've been so out of it, I think. Yeah. So that's my honest. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, I uh, have, had never actually thought of myself as a Himalayan writer mm -hmm. until I saw the program. <laughs> <laughs> I was, um, I think I've written from such a narrow space and, and it's going to change, I think, now that I am Canadian and no longer Nepali, which is very confusing. Um, but. Uh, I've written so much in the, the milieu of the nation and the Nepali national sort of uh, story is what I've been struggling with or fighting against or all of that. And so for me, um, I've always thought of myself more like a valley girl, like Kathmandu Valley girl. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I really like that Kathmandu can be something I completely relate to, yeah. what Sitting yeah. said. I completely relate to that. I uh, actually, in my first novel, I made it a real point not to even mention the Himalayas because it was about the mid hills, and you know, you mm. never, it's just not a part of your life if, mm. if in certain areas or where that novel was set. Um, but I like it, I'm intrigued by it. <laughs> yeah. But it's unfamiliar to me, yeah. too. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, you know, for Tibetans, I think we're not legible, right, in the spaces we live in. In Nepal, we're not we're not a thing, right? In India, we're not a thing, in, as far as writing is concerned. So, um, it is nice to sort of also feel like there is um, a Himalayan literature or writings, and we can be um, 
you can have sort of a more clear voice in it, right? Yeah. And not have to hide, you know, in some ways, which we are, I think, in Nepal very often. Yeah. Maybe we make it true by saying it, although we did grapple for a while with what to call this. I mean, just as you grapple with language, we too grapple with how to bring this into some space, and we don't want the mountain to define you. <laughs> Yet, on the other hand, is it something that, that binds? It's something we I think in the interest of everybody's energy levels and time, we should wind up. I'd like to say, I've been struck by how the two of you are at once looking forward and also looking back. Um, looking forward to a future we don't know, and looking back to a past that won't return. But we're very fortunate to be here in the present with you. And um, it's a huge privilege you've come together to share and read. Thank you.